صلوا على محمد وآل محمد A second time for the love of Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein A third time for the love of Sayyidah Fatim Al-Yara Salaamu Alaihi Wa Alaihi أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you O Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المعصومين May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you and upon your holy household, those who were oppressed. Sallallahu alayka, Sayyidi ya Aba Abdullah. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you, my master Aba Abdullah al Hussein. السلام على الحسين Salutations upon الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين and upon علي the son of حسين السلام عليك يا أبا الفضل العباس Salutations upon you O أبا الفضل العباس السلام عليك يا حوراء زينب Salutations upon you O زينب الحوراء السلام على أصحاب الحسين Salutations upon the companions of الإمام الحسين وعلى الذين بذلوا مواجههم دون الحسين and to all those that gave themselves unto the way of الإمام الحسين غريب كربلاء غريب كربلاء مظلوم كربلاء مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم surely we wish we were with you Sadati, our masters, Fanafuz, O Allah, Thawzan For surely for us, that would be a great victory. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un Surely we are from Allah. And to he we shall return. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل بيت رسول الله إلى أي منقلب ينقلبون. And those who oppress the holy household of Allah will know what their eternal abode shall be. والعاقبة للمتقين. And the best of outcomes are to those who are God wearing. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in the chapter of al Nazi'at, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Wa amma man khafa maqama rabbihi wa nahan nafsa anil hawa, فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this holy verse, He says, And as for he who prevents himself 
from following his whim and his desire, then eternal paradise will be his abode. One of the key ideas behind the lecture series that we've been going through in the last nights of this event of Ashura is how it is that we can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the representatives of Allah and with the book of Allah in understanding Allah's justice and man's injustice in understanding that information is power and that if we understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, what our purpose is in life, then surely we would be able to be of those who would be the victors of an Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi, who on the day of judgment would be standing with the blood of an Imam al-Hussein on us as though we were one of his companions on the day of Ashura. Every action that we take as the followers and the Shia of Ahl al-Bayt is not only a representation of who we are, but it's a representation of our allegiance to them and our allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we raise our hands and put it on our head and we recite Dua al-Hujjah, Dua of Imam al-Zaman sallallahu alayhi, when we do that we are bearing allegiance to our Imam and by doing so we bear allegiance to every Imam before him including the Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi When we come here and we visit the Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi by attending his sessions and his majalis, then insha'Allah it would be counted for us on the day of judgment and for our parents insha'Allah as though we visited the Imam al-Hussein. It is said that he who visits the Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi on this day, it is on the day of judgment that he will be counted as one of the companions of Imam Hussein We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to visit Imam Hussein next year insha'Allah at the shrine of Imam Hussein. <coughs> that we are there with those masses that visit him every year. That's something we should work hard to do insha'Allah, especially as youth. Our maraja, when I sat with them, they all said to discuss those things that we discussed in these lectures so that we can establish with you an understanding of Karbala truly in its reality. This is why I discussed the things that I discussed with you because I actually was instructed to do so by our Maharaj. I say this is time, may Allah bless him and give him and prolong his life. He said to make sure that you give my salams to the youth of America and let them know that every morning I make dua for them. Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al-Hakim, may Allah prolong his life, who is also an Ayatollah, a great merja. He specifically told me, speak about theology and ideology and make sure that our youth understand the importance of Karbala and understand the importance of knowing their faith. Ayatollah Bashir al-Najafi, he put his hand on my chest and he said, Al-Amal, Al-Amal, Al-Amal. He said, this is a call to action. Let everybody know that this is a call to action. Ayatollah Fayyad, he said, make sure that our youth connect with the seminary of Najaf and with their Maraja. These things that they said to me, I relate to you on this most important day. Because this truly is a message that Imam Hussein Salamullah Alayhi wants you to hear from his representatives here today. The verse that we recited at the beginning of our talk is a very important one. Because it also relates greatly to another verse that we mentioned, the verse of the verses three and four of the chapter of the star, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says speaking about his prophet and he does not speak of his whim and his desire and speaking is an action for surely he the prophet of Allah is not with revelation and the first verse says and as for he who prevents himself from following his whim and his desire for paradise will be his eternal abode 
So that's a key that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. He says, look, if you want to be of the followers of Imam Hussein and the Prophet of Allah, then you are to do one most important thing. And that is to prevent yourself from falling into following your whim and your carnal desire. Do not act, do not respond to something out of desire. Don't be a reactive human being. Be a contemplative one. Be a human being that before they make a decision, use your intellect to actively choose what Allah wants for you. <coughs> Today, on this most sad of occasions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi to give his life to give his life in the way of Allah so that we never forget Karbala. So that we understand why, why Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi gave his life. So that we understand why he took his Ahl al Bayt just as the Prophet of Allah took the Ahl al Bayt with him on the day of Mubahala. For them to be hujjah, to be proof upon the Christians and on this day, Imam Hussein would use the Ahl bayt as a hujjah, as a proof upon the world. So that this would resonate in our hearts and our minds and we understand that this was a battle between those who chose not to follow their women desire. A battle between those who chose not to follow their women desire, to choose Allah and their Imam above all. It was a battle against those who chose to follow their women, their desire. To stand in the face of Allah. Know, brothers and sisters, that following your women desire is what leads one into falling into error, sin. Oppression of oneself and oppression of others. You say, well, today our Imam is not here. You say, no, our Imam is here. But we have not realized him because we still follow our women, our desire. Our Imam al Hajjah, Ajallah Ta'ala, Farajah al Sharif. He is waiting for us not to follow our women's desire, to choose Ahl al-Bayt. The narrations are very clear, and the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt are very clear. The Prophet of Allah, Sarawatullahi wa salamu he said, Aqdaakum Ali. He says, the most just of you is Ali. And yet, people didn't go to him when he was there. People still chose to follow others, following their whim. After Imam Ali passes, and not only that, they fought him. And after Imam Ali passes, what happens? Those who take over, what do they choose to do? They choose to legislate their own legislation. They choose, they even have the audacity to say that there were things that existed in the time of the Prophet of Allah, rulings that today, I forbid and today I punish for the audacity of people to follow their whims and their opinions and their carnal desires and stand in the face of Ahl al-Bayt and by doing so they stand in the face of Allah. Today people stood in the face of Allah by standing in the face of their Imam. In the time of Imam al-Sadiq and every Imam Every Imam had companions and each one of those companions was, was authenticated. Just like in the time of the Prophet, where the Prophet of Allah said, Salman al minna ahl al-bayt. Say Salman al-Muhammadi. Salman is of us, ahl al-bayt. Say Salman al-Muhammadi, don't say Salman al-Farsi. Salman the Persian. <coughs> Salman was not was not of Ahl al-Bayt, but the Prophet of Allah made him of Ahl al-Bayt. Why? Because he did not follow his whim. He followed everything the representative of Allah told him. And by doing so, he became a representative of Allah. He became a sign. He became a kalima. We move forward to the time of Imam al-Sadiq where he says, 
where he says Zurara tun thiqah, Zurara, his companion, is trustworthy. He who takes from him is taken from me. We move to Imam al-Hadi who speaks of Al-Amari, the first ambassador of our Imam al-Hujjah He says to him, he says, he who takes from Al-Amari has taken from me. We move on to Imam al-Hasan al-Askari. He says, he who takes from Al-Amari and his son Muhammad, it is as though he has taken from me. Each one of these companions is a marja, is someone to emulate. During that time, they would go and teach their companions, who would teach their companions, who would teach their companions. And there would be the system of authentication so that we understand what it means and who it is that truly is following their whim and who isn't following their whim. Our Hajjah, Salam Allah Alayhi. When the signatures and his letters would come out in his occultation to his ambassadors, he would say after the last ambassador, before the last ambassador would pass away, he'd say, say to them, he would say, to follow those jurists, grand jurists, those who are ruat hadithina, those who narrate our narrations, who were the ones that narrated the narrations of Ahlul Bayt? But those who were authenticated by Ahlul Bayt. Those who were authenticated by their companions. This was not a system that was established out of women desire. This was a divine system that was established by Allah. Established by the Prophet of Allah. By the Wali of Allah, Ali ibn Abi Talib. By Al Hassan and Al Hussein. And Ali ibn Al Hussein. And Al Batir. And Al Sadiq and the Kazim, and the Rida, and the Jawad, and the Hadi, and the Hassan Askari, and the Imam Al Hajj Al Mahdi, and this was propagated by the ambassadors. And today, the Maraja today that we have, Aghasistani, those in the Najaf Al Ashraf, those in Iran. Our great jurists, our grand jurists, all of them have certificates of authentication by way of their teachers, by way of their teachers and their teachers and their teachers up to the companions of Ahl al-Bayt. The companions who were taught by Ahl al-Bayt. Not only up to Imam Sadiq, but up to the Prophet of Allah, who was authenticated by Allah was brought down by Allah for us, by His benevolence. Today, our goal is to connect ourselves with those who do not follow their women, their desire. Those who represent Al Imam Al Hujjah Salam Allah upon this earth. Our Maraja and Al Najaf Al Ashraf have told me, tell our youth to connect with the Marja'iyah of Al Najaf Al Ashraf. Why? Why do they say this? Why do they say connect with your marja'iyya? Because this is what Imam al hujja said. And so, what does that mean? We know for a fact we're not following them. You say, well, how do I know a true marja from a marja that is not true? Say, ask for their certificate of what? Authentication. Each marja has a certificate of authentication, just like the companions of our Imams were authenticated, the system of authentication continued until our time. Until our time. Nothing would be left to chance. For those who ask, well, our Hujjah is in an occultation, how do we know who to follow? Our Hujjah and our Imams and the Prophet of Allah gave us a very solid system to know who to follow. The system of authentication is important. Why? Because we need to know that we're not following our whim. And someone's opinion who's saying these are things that existed in the time of Allah and my opinion is different. No, no. There's no room for opinion. If I want to be the follower of Imam al Hussein and one of those who are his companions, then I must know how to do so. And I can only do so 
and know how to do so through whom? Through those who are authenticated by those who were mentioned in that chapter of prophets, chapter 21, verse 73. Those who are rightfully guided and placed on this earth and unto whom Allah revealed how to do good deeds, how to pray, how to give zakah. And those were the ones who are worshippers. And my goal is to be a worshipper just like Allah asked for me to be a worshipper. He said, this is the reason why you were brought onto this earth. وَمَا خَلَقْتِ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ What is this ibadah? This ibadah is the seeking of perfection. Why? Because we know that these imams are perfect, assigned to us by Allah, assigned as representatives on this earth. We said they have to be perfect by default because Allah is perfect and Allah would not put Anybody except someone who is perfect to lead us. And anyone who shows imperfection, no, he is not a representative of Allah. On this day, brothers and sisters, on this day, Al-Imam Al-Hussein, Salamullahi Alayhi. On this day, Al-Imam Al-Hussein would wake up for for the morning Fajr, and it is said they stayed overnight praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of dua, asking Allah, asking Allah to have mercy on their souls, asking Allah to save them, asking Allah to prevent the evil people from becoming oppressive. To prevent them from following their women, their desire. To make them realize their imam and the reality that exists before them, but they are blinded. They are blinded. They don't see the truth. There are locks on their hearts. They see the Quran, but they don't follow the Quran. Why? Because they don't understand the Quran. Why? Because they don't take the time to understand the Quran. Why? Because they haven't connected with their intellect. Why? Because, because they have followed their women, their desire. It is said that Imam Al-Hussein, Salamullahi Alayhi, when the Adhan was sounded, everybody could hear it. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Everybody ran towards the prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Everybody would stand in line preparing for what could be their last Salat al-Fajr. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. And the people in the other camp, they heard this. They heard this call for prayer. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammadin. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Did they believe in the shahada, those people that were in that camp, that were standing in the face of the household of the Prophet of Allah, and by doing so, we're standing in the face of this very shahada that they were hearing. <coughs> we're standing in the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the choice of following their will. Ashadu anna aliya Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Ashadu anna aliya Amir al Mu'minin Waliyullah. They were standing in the face of Amir al Mu'minin defying the shahad, this third shahad. So many of them were there in Ghadir Khum when they pledged their allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So many. And there they were standing against his own children. What prayer is this? What prayer is this that they're hurrying to? Hayya 
حي على الصلاة means hurry to prayer. حي على الفلاح means hurry to success and victory. حي على الفلاح حي على خير العمل hurry hurry to the best of deeds what's the best of deeds what's the best of deeds but paying allegiance to Allah in five prayers that we pray this is a true sign of choosing Allah over all things حي على خير العمل. They stand in salah, the people in the other camp. They hear the adhan, the people in the other camp. And we realize how significant that adhan was. Because truly, it was a call to following the Ahl al Bayt and standing with Allah or standing with the Shaytan. Choosing their pride, just like Shaitan said, you created me from fire and you created him from clay. And what was the problem here? They did not want to acknowledge the clay of Adam. They did not want to acknowledge the representatives of Allah on this earth. This was the call to prayer on that day. This is the call to prayer today. Who do you choose? Do you choose? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Do you choose that Allah is greater? Is that what you choose? Or do you choose that you are greater through your opinion and your whim? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. The ones that were truly saying La ilaha illallah on that day, that there is no God but Allah. The camp of Al Hussein, Salamullah, or the camp of those others who were defying him and standing in his way. Al Imam Al Hussein, Salamullah, would stand up in prayer and pray the congregational prayer, and then he would get up and he would give a sermon, and in that sermon, he would tell the people, and those in the other camp could hear him. He would tell them why he came out on this day. He would advise them and tell them, you still have a chance. You still have a chance to change your mind. You still have a chance to stand with the Ahl al-Bayt to the last minute. There's still a chance to change, to change ourselves not to follow our whims. Everything that happened on that day was symbolic, subhanAllah. Everything that happened on that day, we can relate to today. And Imam Al-Hussein, salamullah alayhi, would conduct two sermons on that day. And after those sermons were over, there would be some people who would wake up from their sleep. And I'm not talking about people actually sleeping. I'm talking about the sleep of this dunya, mm -hmm. of following your whim, of this ghisha with this blurriness that covers our eyes and covers our hearts. We say, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. But do we say, Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah? And acknowledge, acknowledge the Holy Quran. Acknowledge the Ahl al-Bayt, and Imam al-Hussein, salam Allah would place at that point, would prepare his right flank and his left flank, and his left flank, and he would give the flag of Ahl al-Bayt to al-Abbas. Between the right flank and the left flank, Abbas would be in the middle, and that is where the Ahl al-Bayt would be. What would happen then? Zuhair ibn al Qayn, who was in charge of the right flank, and Habib ibn Mudahir was in charge of the left flank, and Al Abbas, who was in charge of the middle, of holding the raya of Ahl al Bayt. This system would be faced by the enemy of Allah, 
which was composed of 30,000, the narrations say, 30,000 who came from Sham so that they would stand in the face of the representative of Allah on this earth. On the right flank, Urwa ibn Qais. On the left flank, Shimr ibn al -Jawshan. In the middle, the weight. The right flank, so that you understand why we say the right and the left flank, the right flank would battle with the right flank. And the left flank would battle with the left flank. And Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, after receiving Hur, who realized upon speaking to Umar ibn Sa'd that this was actually going to happen, this battle would actually happen, he would run towards the camp of the Prophet of Allah and he would ask for repentance when he threw himself off his horse onto the feet of an Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, and he would say to him, I am the one, I am the one who made your trip harsh. I am the one who stressed the family of the Prophet of Allah. I am the one who moved you from Kufa and brought you to this land of martyrdom and slaughter. I am the one. Is there forgiveness for someone like me if he stands by your side? <laughs> Imagine your heart. Imagine today you're asking for Imam Hussein for repentance. It's not too late. No matter how many sins we've done, it's not too late. Today we are Hur. We ask Imam Hussein, is there a place for me with you, O Hussein? <coughs> Imam Hussein would look at Hur. Just as he would look at you and me. And he would say, Yes, there is a place for you by my side. In heaven, there is. Al-Hur would say, by your permission, let me be the first to go out into the battlefield and give my life in your way. Notice the symbolism of this repentance. Notice how Imam al Hussein, with all the companions around him, who would he let to represent him? The first one to repent to Allah. The first one. He would be given that honor. He goes out and he fights a valiant fight. He fights until there is no, no breath left in him. He fights and kills over a hundred men. They were so fearful of him. He was a brave warrior from a very strong tribe known for their valor and their bravery and their courage. He went out there. He slaughtered so many of them. But how many of them were they? They weren't a hundred or two hundred or three hundred. There were thirty thousand of these men. 30,000 and he would stand in their face until they would slaughter him. And then Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, would come to Al-Har, would run to his side, this man who repented and chose Ahl al bayt and chose the way of Allah. Surely he said, I'm choosing between the heaven and the hellfire, and there is no choice but the heaven. Imam Hussein, salamullah alayhi, went to his side, he would hold him. Lucky Hur, he would hold him on that day. <laughs> and he would say, surely, <coughs> surely, O oh Hur, you are Hur. You are free today, just as you were free on the day that your mother gave birth to you. Inshallah, we can be Hur also. <laughs> Inshallah, we can give ourselves in the way of our Imam by walking in the path of the companions, choosing the Ahlul Bayt and Allah over our whims and our desires as he did, choosing paradise over the Al-Fatih. It was then that the rest of the companions would go out into the battlefield one after the other. Muslim ibn Awsajah would go out into the battlefield. He would fight valiantly he would kill so many men, but finally, so tired, so tired, the armor was so heavy on him. Even the, the sword that he was holding was heavy on him. He would be struck 
with arrows and with swords and with spears, and he would fall to the ground. And he would call out to Imam al Hussein, Wa Husayna, Wa Sayyidah. Imam al Hussein and Habib al Mudar would hear him and they would run to his side. They would run to his side and they would come to him and see him laying on the floor. <coughs> Habib al Mudar would come to him, he would hold him, he'd say to him, <laughs> He'd say to him, It's so hard for me to see you this way. Imam Hussein, salamullah alayhi, looking at his companion, would say, would say, it is so hard for me to see you like this that I wasn't able to come to your aid. Muslim ibn Awsajah, talking to Habib ibn Mudahir, he would say to him, Habib, Habib, I want you to take care of this man, of our Imam. Habib ibn Mudahir, he said to him, I would ask you to give me your will. Tell me what you want me to do after your passing. But I know that I will pass too. I know that I will be martyred soon, he said. He said, I only ask you one thing. Take care of Al-Husayn, salamullahi alayhi. Habib ibn Mudahir would go out also to the battlefield. And he would fight valiantly. This man was over 80 years old. This tells us that you're never too old to seek the truth and to stand for the truth. Never too old. <laughs> he would go out into the battlefield, this great general of Imam Ali, salamullahi alayhi, who gave himself in the way of Ahl al-Bayt time after time. Time after time, and this was the last time that he would give himself in the way of Ahl al-Bayt. He would be struck and fall to the ground, and Imam Hussein would come to another companion, Habib ibn Mudahir. Habib ibn Mudahir was so humble, though he had such a high status that one Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab said, who is this who came to the camp? And when she found out that it was Habib ibn Mudahir, she said, tell him, Give him my salams. And when he heard this, he would throw the sand on his face. And he would say, who am I for Zainab to send her, to send her salam to me? Here he was now, he was sending his salams to Ahl al-Bayt, bidding his last farewell to Imam al Hussein, who would hold this general in his hands <laughs> and cry for him. And know that the Prophet of Allah, and in that first sermon, Imam Hussein told them, he said, he said, know that when you give yourself in the way of Allah, know, know that the Ahl al-Bayt, Emir al-Mu'mineen, know that Fatima al-Zahra, know that Nabi Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are on the other side waiting for you, with cold buckets of water, which you will drink from, you will drink from and you will not feel thirst after that day. And it was Habib who then would take his last breath and meet the Prophet of Allah who would have water for him to quench his thirst on that day. Abbas would go out. Abbas was known for his love of Ahl al-Bayt. Notice the love of Abbas. The companion of an Imam al Hussein who would go out and fight valiantly on that day. And on that day, he would be so overtaken with the love of Ahl al-Bayt that it is said, he threw his sword, he threw his armor, he threw his shield, and he just ran into, into the enemy of Allah. Abbas was not a small man. He was fearless. He was huge in size. They feared him, and he said, Hubbul Hussain, ajannani. He would say, the love of Al-Hussein has maddened me. And he went out as though in defiance, saying to them, saying to them, I give myself willfully and freely to Ahl al-Bayt and to the way of Allah. And he would die on that day on the land of Karbala. And one companion after companion would be seen by Imam Al-Hussein fall onto the land of Karbala. One after the other, it is said, just from the first stream of arrows that was launched. After Umar ibn Sa'd launched his first arrow and said, Bear witness to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Yazid that I was the first to throw 
my arrow into the camp of Ahlul Bayt. After that arrow, there would be many arrows that would come. In that first, in that first shower of arrows, 50 men would die. 50 men. There were only, it is said, some riwayat say that there were 82 between those who were on foot and those who were on horse. Others would say 74. Today when we go to the land of Karbala, to the shrine of Imam al Hussein, what do we find? We find each one of their names there. <laughs> How lucky they were. We only pray that we were from them, that we were with them, for surely that would be the greatest of victories for us, surely. Today their names are eternally there. Not only on this earth, but in the hereafter, are our names going to be there, I ask. Will my name be there, O Hussein? <laughs> you are all servants of Imam al Hussein on this day. Imagine yourself there. Would you want to register your name on that day as from those who stood for Imam al Hussein? After looking out, realizing there was nobody there, Al Hussein alayhi, will tell, would be approached by Al Abbas. He would say, Let me go out. He'd say, No. Time after time, Al Abbas would ask him. He would say, No, you can't go out. You're my flag bearer. I can't let you go out because if you go out and the flag falls, then we shall be defeated. I need you. I need you to take care of the camp and the women and the children. Remember, he was in the middle and the camp was in the middle. What would happen then, dear brothers and sisters, is Ali al-Akbar would come to his father. <sighs> imagine, brothers, imagine you're the oldest son and you have to come up to your father. And that this would be the last time that you would see him. Because you had to go out and fight in the way of Allah. Imagine, brothers, you are the father of Ali al-Akbar. Imagine. Imagine how a father would feel as he would send his son out into the battlefield. Imam Hussein would hold on to his son Ali al-Akbar. Would hold on to him tight and cry and cry. <laughs> Knowing that he would not see him. For a little bit. This is how, how strong the relationship was between the father and the son. That he knew he would see him after he would be martyred. He knew. He knew. But he said to him, dear son, be patient. For only in a little while, who will receive you? But your grandfather. Your grandfather, Imam Ali. And your grandmother, Fatima al-Zahra. And your great grandfather, the Prophet of Allah, he will receive you. Ali al Akbar would go out into the battlefield and he would fight valiantly and he would strike them one after the other. It is said that he killed 80 men. A second time he goes out, it was said that he killed 120 men. And the second time that he went out, Layla. The wife of Imam al Hussein, the mother of Ali al Akbar, would be standing next to her husband, looking out proudly as their son would fight a valiant fight. And then he would be approached by one of the Yazid's men, and they would be fearful for his life. Imam Hussein would tell Layla, Go into the tent and pray for your son. For the prayer of a mother surely is answered by Allah, and she would pray for him, and that prayer would be answered. And Ali al Akbar would defeat him, and he would come back into the camp and say, Say, oh, Father Hussein, oh, Father Hussein, I just need a drop of water, just a drop of water. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. He said to him, son, the Prophet of Allah will receive you with a cup of water. Go back into the battlefield. Hurry to meet your great grandfather. Hurry. He went out into the battlefield and it was then that he would be struck with an arrow in his eye and he would fall onto his horse and the horse not seeing which direction he was going from the blood that was gushing from him would run into the camp of, of Ibn Sa'd and it was there it was there that they would all come at him from right and left and front and back. The arrows would shower him, the spears would hit him, the swords would slash him. And it would be that day that he would pass away onto the battlefield. Imam Hussain sallallahu alayhi seeing this, would run towards his son. He would go and pick him up and he would cry and cry and say, 
It's so hard for your father to see you like this and not be able to aid you, my son. <laughs> but surely, you see, he said, yes. With the littlest of breaths, he said, yes, surely, I see. I see my great-grandfather. There he is. <laughs> Farewell, Hussein. Farewell, oh, father. I have to go to the Prophet of Allah and get a drink of water. <laughs> and Imam Hussein, salam Allah, alayhi, would carry his son into the camp with heavy shoulders on that day. Layla would be crying, Sayyidah Zainab would be crying, all of them would be weeping and crying on that day. It is said that there was a special tent where Imam Hussein would keep those who would be martyred <coughs> from his family. He put them in that tent, he put Ali al-Akbar in that tent and said he lay down next to him. As though preparing himself, as though knowing that he won't be lying next to his son in a few minutes, he will be lying on the land of Karbala away from that tent. <laughs> Imam Hussein at that point, at that point, would be approached by Al-Abbas Please let me go out into the battlefield. He said, just go get water. He went out to Al-Abbas to fetch water for the camp for the women and children who were thirsty. And Abbas would go faced by 4,000 men as he approached the bank of Al-Furat. He would fight valiantly until he was able to get to the water and when he picked up the water <laughs> he said ya nafsuni ba'd al husayn la kunti an takuni he said oh nafs oh self oh self stand down how can you think about this water surely before Hussein you are nothing and after Hussein you are nothing how can you think of drinking this water knowing that the Imam al Hussein is facing death and that the camp are thirsty and have no water? He promised Sukaina that he would bring water back to the camp. He promised Sukaina that he would bring her water also. They were expecting him to come back, but as he was heading back, he would be surrounded by all these men. He would fight valiantly, but then someone hiding behind. <coughs> a palm tree. Well, he was distracted, would hit him on his right arm, slashing his right hand. If his hand would fall to the ground, he would hold the water on his left shoulder. He would hold the flag still up high, and he would hold the sword in his left hand and fight valiantly until he was distracted because he was, he was surrounded by these men, these evil men. And finally, he would be struck on his right hand, and his right hand would fall to the ground. And then he would hold the water the water from the string in his mouth and his flag is held up no way to fight now now it was just a sprint back to the camp but he wouldn't even be able to do that at that point at that point an arrow would be launched where where ibn sa'ad said launch the arrow o harmala launch the arrow throw it into this water, let the water spill, as though they're saying this symbolic water, this mercy of Allah, even that we won't give you. <laughs> even that which is rightfully all Muslims, just a simple drink of water, even that will prevent you from. Allah did not forbid us from water. When they were thirsty, Ahl al-Bayt gave them water. Why do they act like this? An act of women desire, take even the water away from the children. Okay, the adults, but what about the children? Abbas at that point, struck in his eye by an arrow, right after the arrow went into the water, seeing the water spilt, what was left? What was left now? His trip was for nothing. His trip to Furat, killing those men, bringing the water. No, it wasn't for nothing, brothers and sisters. This was symbolic. This would teach us that wind can take you to a point where you would even prevent women and children from drinking. Where you would even kill Al-Abbas, who was the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, raised by him for so many years, for 14 years, 10 years by Imam Al-Hassan, 10 years by Imam Al-Hussein. You don't get more connected to Ahl al-Bayt and your Imam than this. And yet, they stood in his face. And yet, they cut off his hands, the very hands that would touch, that would touch Imam Al-Hussein and hold his hand as a child. The very hands that would hold the hands of Imam Al-Hassan. The very hands that were caressed by Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
the very hands that would be unable to deliver water to the camp of the prophet, of the household of the prophet. And then what would happen? A man would come. He would not be able to see from the blood. And then he would strike him with a metal beam on his head and he would fall to the ground. Now, what was left of an Abbas when they came to him and started stabbing him and slashing him with their swords? Nothing. Imam Hussein sallallahu he came running to the Imam al Hussein, and Imam al Hussein, hearing, he couldn't see anymore. He heard someone coming, and he said, he said, just wait, wait. I want, I want my brother Hussein. Imam Hussein sadly said, I am your brother Abbas. <laughs> He went up to Al-Abbas, he lifted him, he put him in his lap, Al-Abbas removed himself from his lap. He tried a second time, Al-Abbas removed himself a second time. The third time he removed himself, the third time he said, why do you do this? He said, how can I have you hold me when I know no one will be there to pick you up and hold you when you die, when you are martyred on the land of Karbala? <laughs> Al-Abbas... He requested from Imam al Hussein. he said, please don't take me back to the camp. Don't put me in the tent. Please don't put me there. Let me just die here. If you take me back, how can I face Sukaina? How can I face Ruqayya? They're thirsty, they want water, and I have no water to give them nothing. <laughs> Imam al Hussein, salam Allah alayhi, would return to the camp. And they heard him coming, and the children ran to the forefront of the camp thinking that Al-Abbas had come to them with water. And as they came and saw Imam Hussein, they asked him, where is Al-Abbas? Where is my, where is my uncle Abbas? Sukaina said, where is he? Ruqayya, where is my uncle Abbas? He said he would bring us water. Surely he said he would bring us water. It is said that later on that night, if we fast forward later on that night, in the darkness of the night, that Sukaina would not be found in the camp. She would be running around looking for Al Abbas. She would be running out of the camp trying to find her uncle Abbas. And when she found him, she sat at his side and said, You promised me to get me water. You promised me, O oh, uncle, to get me water. Where is my water, O oh, Abbas, O oh, uncle Abbas? Where is my water? Imam Hussein returning to the camp empty handed. <laughs> no Abbas, no water. What was left? <laughs> Al Qasim alayhi salam would be coming to Imam Al Hussein constantly saying to him, Oh uncle, please, please let me go out and fight in the way of Allah. But Imam Al Hussein would say to him, You are the trust. Oh. You are the trust, you are what's left of Imam Al Hassan, Salamullah Alayhi. Al Qasim Alayhi Salam, disappointed, would go to his mother, Ramla, and he'd say to her, Dear mother, I keep going to Imam Hussein and he keeps turning me back. I keep going to him and he keeps turning me back. She said to him, Come with me. She took her, she took him into the tent and she said, to, She opened the chest and she said, Here's a letter, take it to your uncle Hussein. And he, she gave him the sword of Al Hassan, his father. She gave him the armor of his father. She gave him the helmet of his father. When he went out of that tent, it is said, brothers and sisters, that is as though we could, they saw Imam al Hassan. <laughs> Imam al Hassan was there on that day, brothers and sisters. Al Abbas, he went. He went to Imam al Hassan, alayhi, and he said to him, He said to him, He said to him, Here's the letter. Here's the letter that my, my mother has given me. Please read it. Please read it, O Prophet of Allah. Please. So he took the letter. He read it. He then removed from his turban. He placed it on his head. He wrapped his head and he said, Now, now Qasim, surely it is tough for me to see you go out into the battlefield. But this is what your father has willed for you. So he sent him into the battlefield. He would fight valiantly. But his shoe would come. Would come. The strap would be open, and as he went down to try to close the strap, he would be struck on his head. He would be struck on his head by Bukair al-Ahmari. May Allah have damnation upon him. And then Imam Hussein would run to his side. He would carry this young man, and he would say to him, Ya Azzu ala ammika, antunadi fala yujibuk. 
<laughs> he said, surely it is hard on your uncle that you, he hears you call him, but he can't answer you. And when he answers you, لا يعينك, that he can't aid you, he can't support you. And when, he, when you ask for his aid, he can't help you. And so Imam Hussein would come back to the camp and he would take Al-Qasim alayhi salam and when they would come to him, they would say, Where's this? Where's our brother? Where is he? He'd say, Here he is, and everybody would fall crying, crying for Al Qasim. And then, who would be loved but Zayn al Abidin who would come and ask his father, Please, oh father, let me go out. He'd say, You're too sick. Zainab would say to him, He would say to Zainab, Take him, take him back into the camp. He can't even lift a sword. You must take care of this Imam who would remain for the people and then what would happen? And then it would be time for Imam al Hussein to go out into the battlefield. He would fight valiantly until there wouldn't be a breath left. He would fight valiantly at that point. And then what would happen? Brothers and sisters, he would be showered with all of these arrows as he was wiping his head the arrow would come into his face he would be hit with a rock on his head and then an arrow a three-pronged arrow with poison in it would come and strike him in his heart right into his heart and he would bleed he would take that blood throw it into the air it would never come down and hit the ground and then he would lay on the ground and he would see he would bear witness these evil men running into the count burning it, trying to humiliate the women of the household of, Allah, of the Prophet of Allah. He would ask them to leave the women and they would. And then they would all come around him. And then they would slap him and slash, stab him and slash him. Make sure that he's dead. And then Zainab alayhi salam standing on a tell Zainab, he would look for her brother. She would shout out, Wa Hussein, where are you brother Hussein? But what would we, she see on that point? But Shimr coming to Hussein, putting his metal stirrups on his, his his metal boots onto his honorable chest and then he would take a sword he would raise it up into the sky and he would slice his neck until there would be nothing left of Al-Hussein <laughs> nothing left of Al-Hussein he would take his head off the shame the shame the <laughs> shame the shame how could these people call themselves Muslims and do this to Hussein? The shame, the shame, how? And then Zainab alayhi salam would come, but to what? To see her brother Hussein. And the woman would run to Hussein. <laughs> they would hold him and argue, but what to hold? What to carry? <laughs> it is said, brothers and sisters, that the heads of all the companions were given to the different tribes so that they can then present them in the court of Yazid and receive a reward for it. The shame, the shame. Oh, Hussein, the shame, the shame, Allah. <laughs> Shout out to your Imam Zainab, shout it out. Wa Husayna. Wa Madluma. Wa Husayna. Wa Gariba. Wa Madluma. وا حسينا وا غريبا وا مظلوما إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعين أو الله we ask you and we beseech you, Ya Allah, on this day, أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ 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 Oh Allah, oh Allah, He who answers the call of those who are going through hardship and answers, oh Allah, answer our prayers, remove the hardship from the followers of Ahlul Bayt, Ya Allah. Make them able to stand in the face of their challenges, Ya Allah. Make them stand in their, cha to, um, facing their challenges by choosing Allah, by following the path of Allah, the path of Ahlul Bayt, realizing the truth, using their intellects. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Today we repent like a hur, Ya Allah. Please accept, just as you accepted from hur, please accept from us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you, we beseech you that you give health to our sick, Ya Allah, to all those of the mu'mineen who have cancers, who have eye problems, just like the brother in our congregation who has an eye problem, just like those who are in 
Colorado, Sayyid Ahmed Al Husseini, Sister Fatma Idris in Dearborn, um, uh, Sister Manar in Baghdad, the say uh, uh, a couple of the Sayyids in, in in Iraq, and all those that we don't know about, Ya Allah, remove the cancers from their body, make this cancer a way to remove their sins, Ya Allah. Allah remove all sins from their bodies, all sins from our bodies, Ya Allah, from our souls. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Rahman Rahimi, to have mercy on our souls and the souls of our dearly departed, to have mercy on the soul of Brother Rida Hussein. Faqir Muhammad, Ya Rahman Rahimin, who was the servant of Imam Al Hussein. Allah, please make us servants of Imam Al Hussein. Have, Ya Allah, mercy on the souls of the dearly departed of Janab Sayyid, Mawlana Sayyid Nawab. Ya Arhamar Rahimin, on, on the souls of his dearly departed, on the souls of our dearly departed, on the souls of the dearly departed of the founders of the center. And make, Ya Allah, this center grow and make this community thrive, Ya Allah. Bism Al Hussein, Bihaq Al Hussein, Ya Allah, Bihaq Ashura. يا أرحم الراحمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وأن والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين and please recite the surah al mubarak al fatiha on their souls the souls of our dearly departed بعد الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد now do I have a hajj and then we head for salah insha'Allah